Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 How many made it to Sunrise Service? Wow. You know, I got up this morning in plenty of time for Sunrise Service. Scheduled for next year. <laughs> <laughs> and if it rains again, maybe the year after. <laughs> So anyway, I was thinking of you as you were all at Sunrise Service, and I was getting ready to start to drive over here toward Mansfield when the phone began to ring this morning. I don't know why it is. Everybody who called this morning knows I have a Sunday morning uh, Bible study. And every of them started, well, we don't want to hold you up too long, but we wanted to say <coughs> Happy Easter, and I didn't think I was going to get out of the house. So um, glad to be with you, and welcome and invite everyone to this study, including those of you who will be joining us on, on YouTube this morning. A little less certain about where this was going to go. We'll see where it ends up. But we will turn the page. What? We will turn the page. We will be in chapter 12. I was thinking of doing another... About seven was the number of completion. Well, it was, and it was a good completion back there. And uh, But that only completes the seventh chapter. Now we're starting the twelfth one, which will have a seventh of its own, I am assuming. It is enough, It has enough verses in it to be divisible by seven. So that's, that's always a good thing. Um, before I start on chapter 12, though, I would like to just drift upwards a few verses in chapter 11, because we didn't read this at the end of the last uh, study, and this is one of Paul's great doxologies, one of the great praises that he offers. Beginning in verse 33, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him that it should be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now you see the... Um, in the first line of the first verse in chapter 12, that word, therefore, that means we're supposed to pay attention to what has happened just before verse 1. And we've just read them, that doxology. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'd like to take this morning's study, if we could, and concentrate on these first two verses, because they are huge. Particularly when we realize this is resurrection morning. And I would like us to consider these words in view of what and who it was that rose and what it does. We look at these words, and I want to warn us again not to gloss over them because they are archaic figures of speech or because we've read them so often. Read them again like it is the first time. I beseech. Paul, under his apostolic authority, could have commanded, but he didn't. I beseech, entreat, plea, beg. Could have commanded. Brethren, he's speaking to fellow believers. In the previous chapter, he was talking about national and individual Jews. He was talking about individual Gentiles and Gentiles as races and tongues. Believing and unbelieving on both sides of that aisle, now he's talking about believers, and Paul doesn't really care where they come from. A believer is a believer. I beseech you by the mercies of God. Now, that also is not a euphemism. That's not like, um, oh, occasionally you will hear the superstitious say, knock on wood, and it's taken for granted, and that sort of thing. And this is not just a matter of formal speech. See the word by the mercies? Paul is saying considering. And the mercies he's talking about are the ones that he's outlisted in chapter 11. 
the mercies of God. You remember how he divided it up? That while you have mercy, they would see the Jews would see that, and they would be jealous. They would emulate, and by that they would approach the word of the gospel. And while they had it, the proselytes could also come because they saw what was active in it. Remember, all Jericho knew about that pillar of fire, and they knew who had it. So by the mercies which God has evidenced, not only to those in our lives, but in our own lives, this is what he's saying, you consider those that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Letter goes to Rome, you have Jews and Gentiles, believing and unbelieving, obviously in that church, or probably in that church, with a background of both very religious, that's the Jews, and very religious, that's the Gentiles, but it's pagan. They're offering to, how many gods did uh, Rome have? And as far as Rome is concerned, they were living gods. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now let me throw this one out to you and then become a little bit more conversational and don't be hesitant in your response. When you see that, which is your reasonable service, what does that raise in your mind? This kind of goes with the job description? Let's, that's the right answer. Let's focus on that word service. How do you see that? Reasonable is the one that jumps out at me right away all the time. Well, yes. Right. And, 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 and Let's take a look at service. Well, it jumps back to my mind to Joshua. When Joshua had been delivered from Egypt, he was sitting there and he says, listen, this, this is you choose. You make a choice. You choose who you are going to serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So service is that decision of who am I going to serve Christ? I'm going to serve the living God. Any other responses? I, I, I mean, I look at it in relationship to verse 2 because it, it certainly weighs out what service is expected. Um, you're serving the body of Christ, you're serving Christ, um, and reasonable means that if you have already accepted Christ's proficient or your Christ's uh, sacrifice mm -hmm. for us, then that puts a, <coughs> that certainly puts a expectation of what that service is going to be. Okay. I see another hand. Well, I have in here, which I thought was, that makes good sense, in the place of reasonable, rational, mm -hmm. and rational service, then kind of like Frank says, it's stuff that we have learned, there we go, we rationalize things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Oh, he's got the phone going. He's apt to have the English Standard Version. English Standard says. Spiritual worship. There you go. That's why I was trying to get us over onto that word service. We don't view service as worship a lot. Uh, in the workaday church, as it were. But the word which translates from uh, Greek to English can mean service in the way that we say morning service. Evening service, which is worship. And true, it's rational, it's expected. More than that, it's owed. Peter tells us that we are not our own, but we are bought with a price. So it is owed. And it's owed by way of worship. And sometimes I think we misunderstand what worship is. We think that worship is the, or, the order of service. 
you know, that we see on bulletins, we see them in all the churches, that it's the singing on schedule, that it's the, uh, the giving of an offering on schedule, taken up in many churches, um, worship teams, anything else? Well, I mean, almost exclusive, like right now in the church, um, or things that call itself church, worship is singing. The worship team comes onto the stage and leads worship and then leaves after the set list is done. Mm -hmm. And that's worship. So what is worship, folks? Now, remember, you have an answer book open in front of you. What is it? References, you know, being sacrificed and service together, you know, the old sacrifice was a service. And there, you know, it's, you have a minister and everything, who Christ is our minister and that. But I, I think there's, you know, to really study, like you said, some of the root words and things, I think you, there's kind of a connection to sacrifice and service there, not just a, a reasonable service. So in worship, what, right. yeah, so in worship, what is it we sacrifice? See, we see sacrifice as giving up, doing without something. That's not just sacrifice. Sacrifice is not something that you are called to give up. It is an opportunity you get to do. Let me throw out a couple of things that are worship. Now, I'm not saying that giving is not worship. It certainly is. The operation of any of the spiritual gifts, including and not limited to, as the lawyers like to say, the gift of helps. The gift of helps. helps. The gifts of uh, administration. And gifts of ministry, which is also a gift of help, doesn't mean just ministering the word. It means ministering to that neighbor that might need some help in the fall, rolling up that garden hose. That's ministry. Bible study is ministry. It is worship. And sometimes we don't realize. We study the Bible, we read the Bible and pray because we're supposed to. Well, yes, we are supposed to. And by that, I mean, I would suppose that prayer and Bible study would be a natural outgrowth of a Christian life, not an ordinance or a requirement. Mm -hmm. It should be something that you would be, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to keep me from doing. I remember the words of C.S. Lewis, um, when they asked him why he prayed when you couldn't always see the result of the prayer. And he said, I do not pray because it changes God's mind. I pray because it changes me. There's a lot of truth to that. Even if it was an Anglican who said it, I can say amen to that. It changes me, and it's meant to. Which gets us down to uh, some of that bleed over or bleed up from the second verse. Um, and be, that's what keeps us from being conformed to the world. That which, uh, your lives, a living sacrifice, and I want to point out today, particularly, uh, now that we are on uh, resurrection morning, two days past what happened on Good Friday by our calendar. Two days past what happened on Good Friday by our calendar would be three days on a Jewish calendar. But on ours, it's two. Good Friday was the crucifixion. And I want to point out that from Adam to us, God has only asked one son to die. He's asked all the rest of us to live. And gave us the power to do so. He is not a begrudging God. He is jealous of your soul's success for which he has already paid. And the sacrifice of his son has already been accepted. And sometimes I wonder on Easter if we realize what it was and who it was that rose and what it does. That living sacrifice which he is reasonable of his part. Not unreasonable, not dictatorial, but it's reasonable on his part to expect 
this of us. In the same way it was after he laid down the Mosaic law, it was reasonable of God to, to I wouldn't say assume, but to expect mm -hmm. that Israel would obey. And Israel fell out of line, fell out of line, fell out of line in the same way that we have fallen out of line and fallen out of line. But it was still reasonable. And through all that time, he had those who did, even as he does now. Living sacrifice, and the sacrifice is holy. Notice that word? Separated unto God. This is what we do. So no, it doesn't matter if you're rolling up that garden hose for the neighbor. If you are letting Christ live his life through you, you're doing it unto him. In the same way that Paul will later uh, counsel anyone who is a servant or a slave to serve their masters willingly and in good faith because they're really serving their Father in heaven. And let their work Express that here. And if you do so, look at that word acceptable. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one. But growing up and first coming to faith, I will ask this question. Was I the only one who asked myself, is it good enough? Am I Good enough. Here's your answer. The answer is yes. He made it good enough. Extending his righteousness. And be not conformed to this world. Two ways of looking at it. Forced into the mold or shaped the way a carver would shape a figure. Or any shape, so uh, shape to conform, shape by being forced into the mold, like you would a, a plastic. Yeah. Or yeah, don't let, don't let the distractions, don't let that wonderful, uh, persuasive convincing of the world tell you that's the form you need to take. We have the form, which is the statue in the fullness of Christ. And we have it lived out in all four of the Gospels for us. Plus, we also have the indwelling spirit which calls us to it in our own lives. Now you have to go back and remember that in our self, we have, we're powerless to do that. So the question and the choice that we are provided with, which shape will you willingly take? Which shape do you pursue? Is it the shape that the world says? And I want you to notice how carefully that becomes a fad. Times change. Society changes. Social standards change. Boy, haven't we noticed that in the last 25 years. Now, is that what you want to be forced into? And I want you to notice it's a force. You're forced into it. You will take it either by a cutting away or a filling up of something which is not of this word. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I simply suggest again, let the baptism with the Holy Spirit extend to your brains. <laughs> we are told over and over and over how foolish faith is. And it's the foolish, and only the foolish, who say so. Mm -hmm. For what came out of that grave, out of that tomb, and emptied the tomb nearly 2,000 years ago, made it not only foolish, but powerless. He triumphed over it and put it to an open chain. Don't forget that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Okay, how do you prove that? Well, I believe it's the will of God that I move to um, Gorst. I am praying desperately that it never is. And you say it isn't. How do you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? 
These are not meaningless words, friends. How would you prove that? It's the only proof you have. Which doesn't change with time. And how do you prove what is the good and acceptable will of God? Remember that the word you study, the word you memorize, the word you, you, we, we all try to apply, is eternal and unchanging. The methods by which he manifests it may change, but the truth of that word does not change. And from the beginning, his purpose was always redemption. Justification of those who are his. Resurrection is justification. Remember the old song, and it's biblically true. Um, I don't quote hymns, and I certainly do not quote choruses. I, I don't quote hymns very often, but there is one uh, uh, where the chorus of the hymn is, Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever. You can back up every word of that hymn with scripture. He was risen for our justification. He was, uh, he was offered for our offenses. Now, on Saturday, what we call Holy Saturday, he lay for that entire time dead as a stone in that tomb. And what is death? It's separation from God. Now, he went into that tomb bearing your sins. How far away from God are now those sins? Separated. Gone. Beyond the remembrance of an unforgetting God. Do you know how far gone that is? That's really, really gone. We prove. That word prove means to test. To scrutinize. To evaluate. It's a day, that's a day-by-day -day process. But is that good? Jesus told us there is none good but God, so there's the source. What is acceptable? Nothing we can do. Uh, old Uncle Paul, uh, whose uh, epistle we are studying this morning, tells us that the best that our righteousness, uh, as far as acceptability before God, is as filthy rags, so we're not dressed in our own. But we have been made acceptable by the cleansing blood which has been offered in our behalf, and it's not only acceptable, it is complete and perfect. That's what that word perfect there, it is, there's nothing that can be added to it. Once you have reached, once anything reaches perfection, it's difficult to improve upon. And if you were to attempt it, you are adding something to it. And the word tells us, quite definitively, it is finished. Nothing more needs to be done. Everything else is in the hands of God, including the resurrection of that son, which happened on first fruits. We just studied a little bit about first fruits, didn't we, Frank? Okay. Will of God. How do you know the will of God? Oh, we always pray, if it be your will. Are you just supposed to hope for it and stand by and let it happen? Are we just supposed to stand still, hope for it, and let it happen? We're supposed to prove it, test it, scrutinize it. So how do we know the will of God, folks? Quite often we just experience it. Living our lives And quite often, we don't, I mean, for me personally, I don't really understand something that was the will of God. Sometimes until a year later, that the action happened to conform to what God had in mind for my life. You think it's really true that hindsight is 2020? No. <laughs> I have a much more difficult time seeing the future than I do the past. And quite frankly, the past has not been all that congratulatory as I look at it. And we have been told, and it's correct, you cannot base your Christian experience, your salvation experience, on feeling, on emotion, on experience. 
You have to base it on that revelation which comes to God. But once that has been reached and he's revealed himself, you know what he wants you to experience in your life, and you will day to day, employing all the rest of this, is the manifestation of that word in you. That is an experience. And that's the one that we can track. Uh, what is it? The old navigational term was dead reckoning. You know, if you know where you're going and you know where that is, and you can spot that trail that you have come from, you can dead reckon from that and you know what's ahead. We're pretty good at dead reckoning, some of us better than others. Some of us never learn from our mistakes. So what is the will of God? Following just what I just said, and reading these words, which have been handed down now through how many generations from Paul to us, the will of God is that this word manifests. That this word manifests. It will come to pass. And we pray that without even thinking, Oh, uh, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy what be done on earth. That's manifestation, brother. That's what it is. Now, the purpose of that manifestation in my life, in your life, or in any life we observe is redemption. The means is the manifestation, the coming to life of this word. And it comes to us in written form. You want to talk about a miracle? That God can take white paper and black India ink and bring it to life in me. Bring it to life in you. Bring it to life in us together. And there's another word for that that we gloss over a lot. That's fellowship. Without this word, I have no fellowship with a human being. We have parallel courses. And the end ain't pretty. With believers, it's a narrow gate, a straight way, and we walk that one hand in hand, whether you're married or not. Hmm. But I wonder if we realize sometimes we get caught up with schedules, we get caught up with demands of our own life, and then along comes a day like today, which is um, a real high point in the Christian calendar. Now, I know that uh, there will be some on YouTube who will take offense to that because they don't honor one day above another, and that's fine. Uh, if they don't want to raise Resurrection uh, Sunday or Resurrection Day, some people have trouble saying the word Sunday. If they have trouble with that, that's fine. I don't condemn them, and I would hope that by my using it, they don't condemn me. I'm using it as a common point of reference. So when we arrive at the Easter message, whenever it is, that the truth of that message strikes us today, next week, or, or six months from now, I wonder if we realize really, 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 according to the Apostle Paul and what this word is supposed to do in us, what had to come out of that grave? It wasn't just a body. And it wasn't just a glorified body. It was everything that God has said about himself. And if, if Christ came out of that, and they lost any part of that, we're done. Then God has been diminished. For in him dwelleth, present tense, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see what it took? See what it took? You mentioned experience. How about Wisdom. Where do, we, where do we get that? And what is it? By which I'm assuming we are supposed to make this proof of what is good, what is acceptable, and what is the perfect will of God. Wouldn't that be, I'm going to use another one of Paul's terms, wouldn't that be rational? Wouldn't that be reasonable? Isn't that a word-based question? You ever ask yourself this question? And the reason I'm asking you this morning is because when I was in my study for this one, I keep telling myself, you know, I don't think I ask myself this question quite enough or quite as often as perhaps as I should. And because when I don't, I lose the importance of what this word is in my life. It becomes rote. It becomes a physical thing. There's 66 books and I can flip back and forth. And very mechanical, which becomes very ritualistic. 
And ritual by itself, not based upon this word, is probably one of the most hollow shells we've ever invented. With, based upon this word. In the same way that the Lord's Supper service. Yeah, it's a ritual. Is it important? You betcha. If it's taken as more than a ritual. If it's taken as literal proof. And that's why I'm very happy that it's not served in this church unless and until the scripture reading of what brought it forth is placed before the congregation and those who wish to take the bread and the wine. Because it was all of that. In the ritual, you realize the cup he took? As Paul says, the cup of blessing that we bless. Anybody ever seen a Seder? There are four cups. He took the fourth cup, the one after supper. That's the fourth one. That is the general blessing which is not just restricted to Israel. That's the one we're invited to. You serving this morning? So when you serve that, smart, please bear that in mind. The other thing is, one of the, one of the aspects which rose on Easter, on resurrection, on first fruits, have I covered them all? was the one who prayed for you, Rose. Prayed for you. Mm -hmm. John 17, I believe it's 17, isn't it, Pastor? It is. The high priestly prayer. Uh, we refer to that and we call it that every now and then. Um, it's more than high priest. Uh, this is... Um, the fullness of what the Savior was, which includes Lord, which includes Master, which includes Savior, which includes, by adoption, our older brother. When he's praying that prayer out of the deepest anguish that he will experience, emotionally, physically, spiritually, he prays in the 20th verse, after having prayed, for the disciples specifically, he's praying for the eleven. Then he says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Now, how did you get your New Testament? How did you get your New Testament? Somebody, the apostles. An apostle wrote it down. This is their testimony. Oh, you mean the, the gospel written, according written, to Matthew. The written, the written word. I, I'm, I'm talking about the physical thing. Right, okay. Because without this, he has nothing to reveal. With this, I mean, without the body, walking back there in the first century, without the body, you couldn't reveal the Savior. Who was, at that time, the incarnate word of God. All right, we had the body. We've had the testimony of those who saw it post Pre, pre and post resurrection. And now you have a written eternal word by which it comes to you, which is no less real than when the apostles heard from the women that Christ is risen indeed. You have no way to believe that other than this. You have no way to know about it other than this. Am I making myself clear? Is it emphatic enough? And we are told that this is that Christ, in all that he's named, in all that he was and continues to be and will become, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, I want you to pay attention to that. I believe if you go to 1 Corinthians 1, 20-24, you'll find those words stated verbatim. Power of God, wisdom of God. That's why I asked the question, it was kind of a trick question a while ago. Wisdom. Wisdom in the spiritual sense. It's not a collection of facts, names, and dates. It's 
spelled out chronologically. That's history. And you can know all the history that's knowable and still not be a very wise person. You may be very knowledgeable about history and not know very much about music. See what I mean? Wisdom. Psalms tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. He uses them interchangeably. So my question again is, what is it we think came out of that grave on resurrection morning? Proverbs 8. We're going to read a considerable amount of this. And in an ordinary study, I would not take this much time away from the text under our initial consideration. But I would, this morning, because of the day that we celebrate, the day that he hallowed, by that resurrection, Proverbs 8, it's a personification of wisdom speaking for itself. Let's go to the 12th verse. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. That's the 12th verse. Witty inventions. Find out knowledge of that. Some witty are useful, some witty aren't so useful. 20th verse, I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasure. And where are we told by Christ himself to lay up our treasure? In heaven, where it can't be lost. Twenty-second verse, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. And his way leads unbendingly to redemption. Before his works of old. This is wisdom speaking. Remember that. I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning of or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the earth, when he had prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass, upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave this to the sea commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the inhabitable part of his earth and my delights, were with the sons of men. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways, hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors, for whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Now, let me ask you honestly, who do you think Solomon was speaking of? Wisdom, like resurrection, like salvation, like justification, is a person. And that is what came out of that grave on Easter Sunday morning. The power of God and the wisdom of God. So we have a story just like the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just like the apostles had. My throat's getting a little dry. Excuse me for taking another drink of coffee, but I'm going to do it. That should get me to the end of this. <clears throat> we have a story to tell in just the same way that the apostles did. Because his resurrection, his resurrection 
the power that that gives you, the uh, forgiveness that that has purchased for you, the uh, the life that he's laid out before you to live in that power, if we're not conformed, uh, you know, to this world. And if we live that life in the power of the Spirit, which he indwells, which is indwells of the, of his Spirit, which indwells us, is what I meant to say, and mean to say. That's the only way that you resist the conforming of the world, you know, because you have the choice of which enabling spirit you are going to accept, and that is the spirit of this age, and we know who that is. That's a powerful spirit. Or the spirit of him who would conform you to the image of his son, which is not only more powerful than the spirit of this age, this world. It is all powerful. And regardless of how long or short our time on what Proverbs calls the high, uh, uh, the high places of the dust of the earth will be just long enough for you. But when that came out, and the story that it gives us to tell goes back to another chorus that I will quote. I don't know if you've already heard it. It was, it was kind of a jingoistic thing about oh, 25, 30 years ago. You can tell the world about this, and you can tell the nations about that. Well, tell them what the Master has done. Tell them that the gospel has got. Tell them that the victory has been won. Now my question to you this morning is the question I have to ask myself. For whom did he win it? If it is some nameless, faceless mass which will remain ambiguous and amorphous to me, it isn't much good to me. But my faith says he did it for me. My Bible tells me if there was only one who would have needed it, he would have done it. And he did it for that one so magnanimously that in a fallen world, and he knew before he came that all would not receive, he made it possible that all might. And when I think of the word almighty, that's the way I think of it. And it rose on Easter Sunday morning. Don't mean to take away from your service. No. Just a great... Keith, would you... Segue. Well, I don't mean to close this off. Questions? Comments? Responses? Keith, would you close for us, please? Let's pray to you, Father. We thank you today for spending your